if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to be somebody and I'm not going to be one of those $500 throw around the ring dudes that you forget about. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Today, we dive into the world of professional wrestling with none other than Goldberg, known for his powerhouse presence in the ring and an unbeatable streak that captivated fans worldwide, Goldberg shares the adrenaline challenges and triumphs of his wrestling career. But there's much more to the man than just his wrestling persona. Get ready for some behind the curtain insights, laughs, and an interesting story from Bill Goldberg. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Bill Goldberg, it is a pleasure, my brother. Thank you for agreeing to join us today. The world knows you as the professional wrestler, vicious and relentless, who usually dispatched your opponents in under two minutes and then growling, who's next? But I know you as one of the kindest souls I've ever met. When we did fundraisers for the children's hospitals in Syracuse, no one was better with those kids than you. Well... To answer to my my uh, response to that is, I can never hear that enough. Um, firstly, secondly, it takes one to know one, and thirdly, I'm just following in your footsteps, and I'm carrying the torch like those who came after you should have, and I pass the torch along the way. And at the end of the day, man, I'm just continuing to do the wonderful work that you did. And you're setting an example for me every day of your life. So it's an honor and a privilege for me to be on here. And um, the time that has passed since we have seen each other has been way too long. We haven't seen each other in person since Troy and I visited you at your home in San Diego years ago. Gage was just a young boy who you were throwing halfway across your living room on the couch. But I saw a picture of him last week on ESPN, and it didn't look like you could throw him very far. I see he's going to be playing in Colorado with another uh, one of our teammates uh, with the Atlanta Falcons, Coach Prime. Known to us back in the day as Prime Time. How did that come to pass? Because I saw Gage was originally... Uh, going to your alma mater, the University of Georgia? Well, I can tell you this, uh, Timmy, it's a lot different than when you and I were being recruited. Um, I could do an entire podcast on my feeling of the high school recruiting scene right now. And let's just say that it's really, it's really tough on these kids to be a high school senior and to garner a scholarship or actually get an invitation to go anywhere or anywhere. It's pretty amazing. So um, what you you and the public saw transpire in a short period of time last week was only part of it. Um, true, I would have had I would have loved if Gage would have had the opportunity to go to Georgia. But he was completely decided on his choice with the University of Alabama last week. And we came to a conclusion as a family. He got in his car, drove to school, 
And 45 minutes later, I got a phone call that Nick Saban retired. Um, obviously, you know that after making that important decision, you're kind of deflated after some news like that. So obviously, Gage um, completely had to change his thought process. And so we we took the schools that were still at the top of his list. We did pluses and minuses. and pretty much broke it down to that. And at the end of the day, the ability to play for one of our old teammates in a situation that he has in Colorado right now, and my family being omnipresent in the, in, in the state of Colorado, um, the familiarity we have with the program, my nephew played there 10 years ago, and with Dion, it's a, it was a pretty much a no-brainer. So. Um, our minds changed 180 degrees in a in a two hour period of time, but we're we're very, we're ecstatic about our decision. And Georgia was in the mix too, right, Goldberg? Isn't it Georgia? Georgia was in the mix until right at the end. Um, they had a PWO for him, and then I don't think it was available at, right when we made, needed to make a decision. And truthfully, we didn't have any more time to wait. Um, I, th I think it's such a hard decision, but after you make the decision, then you could move towards, um, you know, actually being a part of the program. And so you have some finality and the, the decision's been made. I'm sure that's got to be a weight off your guys' back, the whole family. That is an understatement of the year, my son. <laughs> no question. No question. I mean, it's, it's, it dictates, it's, it's a decision that not only dictates the next four to five years of his life, but, most likely the trajectory of his entire life as a whole. You know, my best friends are still from the University of Georgia. I have so many ties to the school that I went to. I mean, he's going to be the same. And no, Tim, I can't throw him around anymore. <laughs> have you spoken to Coach Prime? You know, I haven't talked to him personally. He's got so much stuff going on. We've been going back and forth. Yeah, I haven't spoken to him. Yeah, like I say, time will time will uh, time will tell when the right timing is of the essence to get on the phone with him. He's got a lot going on right now, quite obviously, with the signing of the other six high school kids. I mean, they had the smallest recruiting class in the Big Ten or the Big Twelve. They only signed seven kids. Everything else was from the portal. Yeah, that's changed the whole dynamic of college sports, college recruiting. The portals, it's, it's it's good for the athletes. It's terrible for high school athletes. It's good for college athletes, I think. Yeah, and it has to be changed. I mean, there's no question about it. I, I, I'm a firm believer that the kids need to be paid, but they need to be paid uh, in a manner that doesn't disrupt why they're actually at that college to begin with, which is to earn an education and to oh, play some football. Yeah, I totally agree. Let's back up a little bit if we can. Um, my Christian faith has had a profound impact on my life, especially since I was diagnosed with ALS. But I understand your religious intensity was as a boy in the Jewish faith. What was that like growing up and has it helped you in any way? You know, um, the, being Jewish was a driving force in my childhood and in my entire life. I'm the furthest thing in the world from a religious person, but I'm extremely proud to be Jewish and to be able to walk this earth and carry that banner. I didn't have many idols that were Jewish sports heroes growing up because there weren't many. I had my brothers. Um, and my father and my, the fact that I was a Jewish kid that didn't look like the normal Jewish kid gave me the ability to walk this earth, be proud of who I am and stand up for what I believe in and stand up for who I am. And hopefully it gave a lot of young Jewish kids, uh, something different to shoot for, you know, a different ideal a different idea that they can do whatever they want to do they can 
uh, be a non-traditional athlete as opposed to the normal doctor or lawyer or accountant, you know, that traditionally, stereotypically Jewish people held, you know, those positions. I was different. And I wanted to accentuate that because by doing that, it set an example for those who, who came after me. When you say that it was like important for you, did you did you consciously think about that as you were doing, whether it was football or or wrestling or even the powerlifting stuff? Did you did you think about it at the time the kind of cultural impact, or is it something now you just now you look back on and you realize it? Oh no, I thought about it in real time because you know situations presented themselves throughout life where you hear about little Jewish kids being picked on because of the way they look, because of the way they act. And I wanted to be that guy who was not made from the same mold, yet carried the same title. And in the position that I held, it, it seemed to have some pull with it. And therefore, I think that I was able to get to a wider audience and make a bigger difference. And let's be honest, if if I wasn't real proud of my Jewish faith, I would have been, you know, the killer or something like that in wrestling, as opposed to using my real name, Goldberg, because <laughs> I knew exactly what was going to happen. And I, and I wanted to use it in a positive way. How about what is going on in Israel? Yeah, I mean, quite obviously, um, current situations lend itself to the breed of more bigots and more, um, I don't know, more uh, uh, hard, hard-lined people, um, it brings it to the forefront. It, it, it gives, it's both a positive and a negative in today's society. It shows you the good in people and it shows you the bad in people. And it, it gives people an opportunity to really learn about history and learn the truth as opposed to what's going on these days with so much misinformation on social media. Um, I did my hand, I did my part, and I'm continuing to do my part in helping the pertinent people over in Israel as we speak. I started when the confrontation started, and I have not stopped until it's all over with. Um, that's behind the scenes, and that's how I want it to be known, but I am making a difference. And each and everybody has a duty to make a difference in their own way. And hopefully what I'm doing is making a, a profound impact. I'm sure it is. So it's funny, I'm doing one of my car shows and we're filming and I brought out a 1959 Biscayne and we're driving the car. It's traditional that I take the car out. We film it. We drive it. We come back. I get out and I talk about the car. Well, they asked me to open up the trunk. Well, I opened up the trunk and the car had been stored for the last six years. And I opened the trunk and it had all my football helmets in it and all the Falcons helmets. So everything happened for a reason. Did they, they, uh, how'd they get all those together? They just went collecting them kind of thing? No, I, when we moved from California, I used our vehicles as, as shipping containers. I, I sent 40 <laughs> vehicles over from California. So why hack in anything other than a vehicle? And I had completely forgotten where I put my helmets. Now I know. That's funny. What made you switch from California to Texas? How long do you have? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have What's to the, say, the I, I have to reasons. say, well, I mean, I have to say, be perfectly honest, the people. Um, I love California for what it has to offer, but not in the people category. Um, I'm a Midwestern guy. I'm a people person. When I go on a movie set, I'm hanging out with the stunt guys and the grips and the camera guys. I'm not hanging out with the actors. So mm -hmm. moving to Texas is kind of like moving back home to Oklahoma, middle of the country, uh, middle class people, a lot of veteran uh, centric businesses. Um, slower pace of life and 
I lived in, on 30 acres in San Diego, and we live on 200 acres here in, in Texas. <laughs> so the fact that uh, I can sit in my garage, get a good workout upstairs in my gym, get on my four-wheeler, drive down to my pond, catch a 10-pound bass, and then go over to my shooting range and not get thrown in jail because I have a, a weapon. Can't do much of that in California, so <laughs> they're in yeah, life. For reasons. Those are a couple of good reasons. Oh, the taxes are a part of it, too. <laughs> so you had a successful career in the NFL, and then you were in Atlanta working out in a gym, as I recall, and there were some wrestlers there who got you into it. Well, I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, um, there was a place called Main Event Fitness, and Main Event Fitness was owned by Lex Luger and Sting, the two wrestlers. And um, playing for the Atlanta Falcons in the offseason, I trained at Main Event Fitness. And as I said, it was owned by the two wrestlers. Therefore, many wrestlers used to frequent the gym. And I had seen a number of them and met a number of them out at night, uh, at some, you know, uh, nightclubs and stuff like that it, in the years past. So I had, I had a little bit of a knowledge of the guys. Um, I Sting and I got to be pretty good friends and, you know, I did the, I tried the football thing. Thank you for saying I had a successful career, but, um, the football didn't work out. I got hurt, and then I had to retire because of the injury and because of the lack of talent. And and the last thing I ever wanted to do was do a nine to five job. But I really had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I had worked so long trying to play football and succeed there. I was like, you know, I know these wrestlers. I really am not a huge fan of what they do. But maybe if I can come up with a character that's reminiscent of what I did on the football field. Combine that with mixed martial arts, which was on its uptick, and you know the ability for me to call upon martial arts because I'd been doing it for ten years prior, um, and 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 I, I guess all of that thrown in a bag and shuffled together turned out to be a good choice for me. But yeah, I think the the times in main event fitness bending bars in front of Lex Luger and and. Buff Bagwell and Sting uh, must have worked. You think if that happened today, do you think you would have leaned more towards the UFC? Hundred thousand percent, no question. Because of because back in the day, the guys who were fighting in the UFC were training at my gym. Mm -hmm. I owned a gym after the main event fitness part called Obaki Fight School, and it was in Atlanta. It was the largest MMA gym in North America. And those guys were training at my gym, Randy Couture, Kent Randleman, Coleman. Um, and so I got to be good friends with them. And we were talking about what they were making as I was trying to decide what I was going to do. And that option went completely off the table once I heard that they were making two to three or $5,000 a, a fight. It's absolutely ridiculous. Obviously, nowadays it's changed exponentially, but yeah, I would have. I would have probably chosen mixed martial arts if the pay scale was where it is now. How long was it between connecting with those wrestlers in the gym and the time you became the Goldberg that was a household name? When you started to get movie deals and you really transcended the world of professional wrestling? You know, it didn't take that long. Um, I, I was a case study that was completely different than the norm. I had come from professional football. I had a look, I had an attitude and I had an idea and it was a mishmash of, of everything that I thought was entertaining in that field. And if I adopted that being who I was and the work ethic that I had, then it would work, but no way, shape or form could I have ever imagined that within six months of me becoming a professional wrestler, I'd be wrestling in front of 45,000 people in Atlanta. Did you come up with your character, which is pretty much just you, or did anyone early on have another idea of who you should be? What is that process like? 
Yeah, the process, I, I can't speak to what the process is like normally, but I can speak to the process as it pertains to me and that, yes, Tim, you know that the character you saw on television was the same flipping character you saw on the football field. <laughs> Um, I was doing nothing but exaggerating what was already inside of me. And nobody had a different idea. Um, I had the ideas in the beginning. I wanted to be called the hybrid because I, I combined so many different martial arts at the same time, along with being a big lug headed 290 pound defensive lineman. But I only had one goal, one vision. I knew it was going to work. It was like rolling the dice, and no one really had a, a competing idea that I ever would have even considered. So I, I, but I, but at the end of the day, my story is so strange and so unusual that it truly all does fall into being in the right place at the right time. Hogan came down from the WWE. He needed a big, good guy to go against from nowhere that people would get behind. There I was. So did you just approach kind of the WCW brass and just said, hey, I've been thinking about it and here's my idea for what it would look like? Yeah, I, I specifically remember the phone call where I picked up the phone. I had an offer on the table from the WWE. It expired within 24 hours and I called um, well, Eric Bischoff and I said, and I knew Eric and I said, listen, Eric, I don't want to be cocky. I don't want to be, you know, an asshole, but I'm, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a difference and I'm going to be somebody and I'm not going to be one of those $500 throw around the ring dudes that you forget about. And that was my statement. And then the door opened and hopefully it'll be just like Gage's entrance into Colorado. All I needed was a door open. And then I did, I did my work. I applied everything that him taught me. I applied everything that Pierce Holt taught me. Uh, I applied everything that Mike Gann taught me. And I, and I did it in the world of professional wrestling as opposed to doing it in the NFL. Did you ever think that you would ever reach the top and then some, or just the opposite? Did you ever think, well, this didn't work out? You know, I would be lying, Tim, if I told you that I didn't think that I would succeed. Um, I can ask you a question, and I know the answer. Was there any ever? Was there ever anything you tried that you didn't know you were going to succeed at? At least have that mindset in that you won't let anything get in your way to you succeeding. So I knew in my own heart that I would I would succeed, but there had to be a lot to happen for that to come true. And I was lucky. I was in the right place at the right time with the right work ethic at the right time to be that character on television. It was it was a genie in a bottle. I was extremely lucky. Who decides who gets to win and who gets to lose? Did anyone ever refuse to go along with it or accidentally go off script? Yeah, well, there's guys that go off script all the time. I was probably one of them and that I went off script because I couldn't remember it, not because I wanted to. <laughs> um, and that happened a number of times with me. But there were a couple of guys along the way that weren't so happy of laying down for a guy that's been in the business for a short period of time. Um, that comes with the territory. I understand it to a point. But at the end of the day, it is kind of fixed right so it's not like doing a true athletic competition where you're actually going to lose um i guess kind of like romo at the end of the longest yard he didn't want to get run over by adam sadler but it's a movie right it's a movie it's not real so um there were guys along the way that a couple of them but they came to it at the you know in the end um, but, you know, again, you're going to have people that are in your corner or against you uh, wanting to see you succeed or wanting to see you fail. It's just life. Yeah, the guys who, who get to choose are, are the Vince McMahons and the, and the uh, um, who did I just, what was his name? Eric Bischoff. Eric Bischoff. I see you know even more than I do. Yeah, Bischoff <laughs> and, and 
uh, Vince get to decide. At the end of the day, it's the most popular. It's who is, whoever's going to draw the most money, um, whether it's a good guy or a bad guy. It's all storyline oriented and it's all fictitious and it's all in the direction they want to lead you. But some guys can do it and some guys can't. And I, I can't really put a finger on it, but I, I, I would go out there and wrestle like there was no one there. Um, I go out and I do my job and I try to do it the best of my ability. And if people enjoy it, great. If they don't, I'm sorry because you can't please everybody. So. I mean, you had, you had 99% of the, uh, the wrestling uh, fans in your corner though. It's not, no, I, you're, so I was going to say you're, you're, you're making it sound like you were, uh, you know, you were the, the, the star of the, the, the WCW and then even the WWE for after the merger happened. You had uh, quite the, you know, quite the fan base, right? Well, I appreciate it. And, you know, you, your father taught me uh, uh, as well as others did. You always be humble and you always undersell yourself. And the fact that I had one person cheering for me is, is pretty amazing, let alone the millions, hopefully, that actually did. So um, I'm, I'm just very thankful that I was able to do it successfully for a short period of time. We we came to a couple of events that you were wrestling in, and uh, you know I got to go backstage and see you, and you put me up on your shoulders and all that. And then I actually had I had nothing on my walls. I had a picture of my dad playing football, and I had a poster of you that said "Who's next?" <laughs> That's what I had in my room. That's to up, hear so. stories like to hear stories like that, man. That just warms my heart. That's just just absolutely awesome. I mean, it it makes me feel as though what I did mattered. And I made a little bit of a difference. And along the way, I entertained some people. One of the things that people loved about Goldberg was that you were undefeated. Tell us about the moment they told you that you were going to lose. Did you argue against it? Did you have an agent? Yeah, I had an agent. There's no question. I'm not going to go in there with my pants pulled down. I've got to have somebody who knows the business representing me. Um, when they told me about me losing, um, again, I'll revert back to the fact that it's predetermined. It's fictitious. It doesn't have anything to do with reality. So it doesn't bother me winning or losing. It's just the way that you lose and the time that you lose. And it really wasn't, it really didn't need to happen on my birthday because it did. That was the only problem I had. I didn't want to lose for the first time on my birthday. So, I mean, do it the day after or the day before. I mean, not my birthday. Wasn't there, was there a little bit of a, a rub, you think, with WCW and WWE or WWF at the time, I guess, coming together? And then do you think that was part of why you're, they had your storyline kind of change course? No, I think because... Um, they, it, it didn't because I was hurt during the acquisition. I was hurt for the last two years of, or the last year and a half of my contract. I had, I had put my arm through a limousine window and got 199 stitches. And I had a guaranteed deal. So the WCW was acquired while I was sitting at home earning money on a guaranteed deal. Got it. So there was, you don't think there was any ill will or any like competition that they wanted to kind of divert your, your whole uh, character? That happened after I got there. Oh, got it. Well, a girl beat my st winning streak. What, what's that? A girl what? Beat my, beat my undefeated streak. Oh, I didn't know that. What's the story there? Yeah, I, I can't even remember. Asuka is her name, some Japanese girl. And they touted her as being the one to have the longest winning streak. And it just so happened that that culminated when I got there, right? And then it just so happened that every single wrestler uses the spear in their moves, right? <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Pretty ironic that that happened when I got there, right? So that's so how they do it. Did something happen when you when you got there that you think caused the the rub where they wanted to change the story? Was there one thing, or do you think it was just kind of no? The fact the fact that I didn't get along with Paul Levesque, which is Vince's son-in-law, I think had everything to do with it when I got there. 
I know that you guys in your storylines too, you guys were kind of you versus this. I know I really watched you versus evolution for a while there. This is when I was 100% sure it was real. And I used to, my whole day would be made or, or ruined depending on if they got you with the sledgehammer or not. So <laughs> I, I didn't know that. I mean, I guess at the time it felt so real, but I, you never know how much of it is, uh, you know, any actual bad blood or. I think a lot of that between Hunter and myself was real. Did, did something cause that or just the personalities didn't mix? We had an interaction when I was at WCW leading the charge in New York at a, at a, uh, a, a press event. Mm -hmm. Um, I had heard he, he, you knew all the behind the scenes, right? So the click and Kevin Nash and Scott Hall and they're his buddies like till the end. And so I hurt myself and I know some people that were friends that worked with me were talking to him when he was working at WWE and he made a comment while I was at home, and I remember it like it was yesterday. And from that sec, he said I was tanking it or faking it or something, and I wasn't there for the demise of WCW, or how could I? So from then on, I wanted to eat that guy's, I wanted to rip his face off. So we had a confrontation prior to me signing at the WWE, and then ironically, we were represented by the same agent, and so it made the situation quite uncomfortable once I signed with the WWE. Let's just say that. Can you say what happened at the event, or is it better for uh, off camera? No, an off camera is pretty good. <laughs> okay, deal. <laughs> Come on, you can't mention putting your hand through a window without telling us what happened. Yeah, um, it was one of those things when the defensive lineman took over, and I was mad at one of my opponents in real life and he uh he was in a limousine and i had to go from the backstage to the ring dispose of someone and then go get in the limousine and uh after i got out of the ring i was supposed to grab a sledgehammer to take care of the limousine and I refused and wanted to use my hand. Therefore providing the highest rated segment on TNT's history on cable television. And it had to go to black and white because there was so much blood with the background of a white limousine. And I got 199 stitches and came a centimeter away from losing the use of one of these arms. This one, I think. But it was good television. <laughs> Always good TV when you get that many stitches. That's all that matters. Once you lost, was there any sense by you or the people around you that the genie was out of the bottle, so to speak? In other words, did you notice any difference after that which you felt couldn't be corrected? You know, that's always a fear. And I can't say that Things were exactly the same by any stretch, but the problem with the character as invincible as the one that I had is, is that when he gets beat, then what? Or, okay, he's beaten everybody, then what? There has to be range. There has to be, it has to be a dynamic character. And I had no range whatsoever. Um, I was a killing machine. I was the Mike Tyson of professional wrestling. And when Mike Tyson can't knock guys out anymore, it changes, it changes the scenery. So that was something that I didn't expect, but I didn't plan for it either. So it was, it was difficult dealing with people afterwards in that you weren't looked upon as the same character. Where did Japan fit into your story? I know you rivaled Godzilla over there. Yeah, Japan, for me, when I was thinking about becoming a wrestler, I studied a lot of tapes with American wrestlers going over to Japan. And the Japanese people love and 
absolutely revere the sport of wrestling, even much, even more so than martial arts, which is truly amazing to me. But they kind of blend with each other in Japan. And it's a much stiffer style, and it's a much more realistic style of wrestling. And I always thought that the biggest and the best that America had to offer were the biggest draw in Japan. And not only did I like the style, but I, I liked the fact that it was a completely different place. And you'd go where nobody knows you and you'd try to make a name for yourself. And I was a huge fan of martial arts. And I worked for a company who owned Pride Fighting Championship. And so they did a little um, cross promotion. And it was a, it, it, I can honestly say it was the best time of my wrestling career being over in Japan. What, when was that in the sequence of WCW to the WWF? Was it in between or was it? A f- yeah, it was after WCW. I spent about a year, I think, training. And then uh, it was it was after WCW and prior to WWE. What makes you say Japan was your uh, the highlight of your wrestling career? Was there anything? I guess you, you're just saying how much you liked it and enjoyed it. Was there something? Was there one thing specifically that kind of made the highlight or? Well, I just revere the work ethic and work rate of the people in Japan, whether it be the Japanese performers or whether it be the Americans when they go over there. But it seems like they kick it into a different gear. Got it. And let's be honest, in Japan, they don't cry if you hit them. (laughs) Is is there a, is the pay scale the di- different or about the same from Japan to the U.S.? It used to be yes. Um, at, at the end of my career, I couldn't have garnered the price that I did per match in Japan, mm-hmm. but it was close. I didn't mean to insinuate you weren't a huge star after that loss because you were. Can you please give us a quick summary of your career after the first loss? I know you were still going as of 2022. Yeah, you know, um, there are many natural segues from the world of professional wrestling. The fact that we go out there and perform from a script, quote unquote, lends itself to obviously Hollywood. And if you can wrestle in front of millions of people in your underwear, if you can grab a microphone in front of millions of people in your underwear, everything else is pretty easy. It truly is. So it made every movie experience and every television experience quite simple because it was it paled in comparison to the amount of embarrassment you would feel standing in front of people wearing your BVDs, you know? Um, so it prepped me for just about anything. Did you have a favorite outside of the, like a Holly, favorite Hollywood movie or show or experience that, that stood out over the others? Oh yeah, the longest you are, 100%. I mean, to be able to be on set with Burt Reynolds, Adam Sadler, Nelly, you know, I mean, Kevin Nash, Scott, uh, 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 Kevin Nash, um, Steve Austin, Romanowski, Bosworth. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, you think we had fun on camera. Off camera was just absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> um, you get those those kind of guys in a hotel for weeks, if not months together. That's asking for trouble. It's nothing unlike, you know, going to training camp and having a room with one of your buddies. Yeah, it was crazy. It was nuts. Can you talk a little about the Bret Hart situation? For you, Mr. Tim Green, I will talk about. For any other piece of the media or any other podcast, I won't talk about it anymore. But Bret Hart... I was a baby in the wrestling business. I was at WCW. I had a rocket in my butt as far as trajectory is concerned, you know, character-wise. And Bret Hart had just left 
uh, WWE, and uh, we all know about Bret Hart being one of the best wrestlers in the history of the world. And I obviously was looking for as many mentors as humanly possible. And I mean, this guy was, he was one of the best ever. And so I was enthralled with him. I didn't idolize him by any stretch. I don't idolize anyone, but I put him up on that pedestal as to be someone to, to very much learn from. And they put us together and I, I did learn a lot from the guy. Um, I wouldn't trade that for the world. Then we had a match, and unfortunately, during the match, something went wrong, and I kicked him in the head. And it was very stiff, and it was an accident. I never maliciously would try to hurt anyone. Well, I, would, I wouldn't try to hurt them yet. Well, let me rephrase that. Um, I would never hurt anyone in a situation like that where they give, the, give me their trust. Because wrestling is like a dance. You can't perform properly if both people aren't doing their thing. And I didn't do the thing right. And he caught it in the head, and it ended his career, and I've never lived it down. And I suppose, Tim, you could probably speak on this more than anybody. Um, You know me. You've known me in situations to where I had to fight Freilich just about every day to survive. And I'm not a malicious person and I would never take advantage of anybody, especially in a physical sense like that. And so it was a complete accident. But to this day, he thought, or he thinks that either I did it on purpose or I was so horrible at what I did that it just happened. So, that's the Red Heart story. I've I've heard it for 15 years, and I've heard about him bitching and moaning about me kicking him in the head. And, you know, I can only say I'm sorry so many times, and I can only be remorseful for so long. So that's where we are. I still want to kill him. <laughs> Is there a, Goldberg, you mentioned how much you learned from, from Bret Hart. Is there a wrestler that, if you had to pick one or maybe two, is there a wrestler that maybe got the most out of you or you learned the most from or is your favorite to work with kind of uh, type of person? Guys that I had known for years prior. The Steiner brothers were huge in the development of the character Goldberg and the person Goldberg. Two guys that I respected exponentially both in and out of the ring. Um, Sting had a huge part in molding me as both a person and a wrestler and gave me the opportunity to look myself in the mirror and be proud of who I was. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention the name Dallas Page because he probably did more for me in my wrestling career than anybody out there. What makes you say that? What, what, I mean, I know you guys had a lot of interactions in, in, the, uh, in the show, but what, what about it? Well, I knew Dallas longer than I had known anyone. And and truthfully, my girlfriend at the time was one of his stable mates. Uh, she was a diamond doll, so she'd go out to the ring with him. And uh, she introduced me to him, and we became friends. And and uh, Dallas is is extremely passionate about what he does. Maybe too passionate sometimes, but he's a perfectionist also. And so we got along in that respect. And he. He was one of the best wrestlers uh, that ever laced up the boots. And to know that he was one of my mentors uh, makes me extremely lucky and uh, appreciative to be in that situation. There's a, on a, on a personal note, Goldberg, we, we have, uh, I have two really good Goldberg stories that I shared one with you already, but I get two other ones. One is uh, I saw Diamond Dallas Page again. This is when I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe eight years old, six years old. And I was 100% sure wrestling was real. Every part of it was real. And we saw uh, Diamond Dallas Page at the airport. And my dad's like, go say, I, I told my parents who it was. And my dad's like, go say hi to him. Because we had just, I think we just li- were leaving one of the shows. And I refused to say hi to him because I was, I, him and you at the time were enemies in the show. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> go up to him. 
And my dad went up and like tried to introduce me. He thought I was just being a shy little kid. So my dad goes up and says, oh, I'm Tim. My son Troy is a big wrestling fan. I still, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say hi to him. And somewhere there's a picture of me with him. And I have this frown, like stone cold frown on my face. I wasn't, I wasn't giving him an inch, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's actually funny to hear because again, just the story you said with, uh, Hunter or Triple H, kind of the issues off, off screen. But then somebody like Diamond Dallas Page, where on the sh- on, on screen it seemed like you guys were, you know, not not close, not forget not close. It seemed like you guys didn't like each other to to be have such a close relationship is really cool. Well, I challenge you to do this: go to YouTube and watch Scott Steiner versus Goldberg. After you watch that, you tell me whether we liked each other or not. And the answer is, I love the man, and that well, makes for a better that makes for a better violent confrontation because you can go to the end of the earth and they know you're not serious. Yeah, I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna watch it after this. I guarantee you, it looks like he hated me and I hated him, but that's the best combination you can have. Scott, I mean Rick Steiner, both of them, both of them. I couldn't have done anything. I, if I would have tried, I couldn't have hurt those guys. And they sure both tried to hurt me. But that's what made it real. That's what made it perfect. That's what made it fun. I rode with Rick Steiner. He was my he was my 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 stable mate, man. He he showed me the road. But he was my best opponent in Japan. Getting off of the wrestling topic, where did your love of cars come from? Well, I was ruined at an early age when my dad was a Jaguar fanatic. Um, then I have two older brothers who both play at the University of Minnesota, 14 and 16 years older than I am, or 16 and 18 years older than I am. And uh, they had these cool cars, and I was growing up as a kid. And I, I didn't have a choice. Um, I had to drive my brother's XKE convertible V12 Jaguar during spring break. I mean, I didn't have another car to drive, so... I think by default, I became a car guy. Is that your, is that your favorite thing you're working on now? Goldberg is the kind of Goldberg's garage and and those types of projects, or do you have something you're working on today that you're particularly excited about? If my camera was working here right now, I'd show you what's behind me, but I got 15,000 square feet of cars. Um, (laughs) I built this monstrosity of a garage that I do a show called Goldberg's garage on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I just love them. I really do. I'm out here every day, so I might as well film it. Yeah, I remember when we came to uh, to San Diego, you had that pretty big garage there. But the, the thing you built in Texas, we, we actually just watched it before this. My dad and I were watching it together. That, that thing is a different different beast. It's on a different level. But, I mean, let's be honest. I... I I've worked my butt off my entire life, and this is only the only thing I really want. You know, I've already got a wonderful family. Uh, my 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 uh, dreams have been answered, and not only does this house the cars that I've worked so hard for, but it houses a three thousand square foot gym that I built specifically for Gage, so that he could live up here, and he has taken it to task. And, you know, this kid, like, let's see, today he's got a scrimmage going on right now, about an hour away, and I'd be willing to bet the farm that when he gets home, he comes to the gym and works out. Do you think wrestling is in your son's future? I sure hope not. (laughs) Uh, If there's wrestling in his future, I got to be his agent, and nobody's going to like that. (laughs) Uh, but the fact is that yes it's nice to have that as a feather in your cap something you can fall back on it's not as if his dad was a no-name goofy wrestler who didn't make an impact so um the fact is tim my son wants to be the antithesis of me um growing up as my son presents a lot of challenges And the one thing that he's been true to since he's been old enough to realize it is that he's his own man. And he's made every phone call, every interaction through this recruiting process on his own. 
except for me picking up the phone and calling Dion. But he he has earned his stripes on his own, and he doesn't want to follow in my footsteps. He wants to destroy them and make his own. So that hurts sometimes. I'm I'm appreciative of it. I, there was a wasn't there a short time where he actually was in some of the he was in some of the shows right where they were kind of wrote him in on your script and you were coming back I think was was it with yeah Osner? yeah I had to have a chink in my armor and he was a good chink and I had never presented my family in that setting and it was perfect and he's very athletic and I guarantee flip and pee you if they had a rematch right now Bobby Lashley would be crying after Gage put him in the stretch <laughs> <laughs> and Tim Gates did 225 for 18 reps the other day on the bench. Wow. Unreal. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Colberg, we're one of the things we're trying to do with the, the podcast is get, you know, cool stories out there for people to hear. Who is somebody that you think we uh, we should try to get, you know, get on the podcast to hear their story or tell their story. Um, from, from my world. It could be from anywhere. Yeah. Okay. I know, I know who you need to call a guy named, uh, two lamb. It's T U. And his last name is L A M. And if you look him up on Instagram, it's uh, Ronin Tactics. This is a real life samurai. He I got it. He was my co-host on the show Knife or Death. He's a tier one boogeyman. <laughs> He's also the most appreciative human being that I have ever met on my in my life. He's a true samurai walking the earth in 2024, and that is his calling. And he is one of the most unbelievable human beings I have ever met, and he's got a story that you will never forget about he and his mother coming over from Vietnam during the war, you know, his father being a special, a, a special forces um, soldier and him growing up here in America and how appreciative he is and was for the opportunity and how he looks at people now that have disdain for where they live and can't understand it. The guy's taught me a lot about life. He's, he's a true, he's a true, Special individual. And he's the main character on uh, Call of Duty. Oh, that's really cool. Culver, what about if, if anybody listening to this, I mean, everybody probably knows who you are, but if they want to follow you or keep in touch with you or hear what you're doing, where's the best place for them to go? The best place for anybody to go to see what's going on now is my Instagram, Goldberg95. I've also got Goldberg's Garage on Instagram. And we're directing a lot of content told towards Goldberg's Garage on YouTube. It's a new YouTube channel that I started a couple months ago. Um, it's car centric. There's no doubt about it. We, we shot a 1959 Biscayne that I have in my collection today. Um, it's just our take, my take on cool cars and what I'm doing with my life. And that's about it. Bill, thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. I love you, brother. I tried to get this out there out before you did, but um, I, I, I got to tell you, Tim, this has been such a wonderful experience because I'm able to see your face uh, for a lot longer than I have in the in the past number of years. And to see you smiling, man, just brings a tear to my eye and it makes me so happy. And I love you so much. And you've taught me so much in life and you continue to teach me so much in life that it's such a pleasure every time I can get on the phone or get on a video call with you 
And just know that I'd do anything in the world for you, man. I, I really would. And I love you like a brother. We got to get uh, we got to get you guys back together in person here soon. Goldberg, thanks so much for for coming on. The one thing I forgot to say before before we end it is the other story is when I was six or eight or ten years old, whatever it was. There's a picture of you. You had a sling on one arm, and with your other arm, you were holding me by the ankle, dangling me over the uh, the second story of a cruise boat. <laughs> I don't know. If oh my god! That. Love those stories. That's fantastic, man. <laughs> it's it's been an honor and a privilege, man, to be on on with you guys. Truly, if there's ever anything you guys need from me, you know where to get me. And, um, I just appreciate the time very much, man. And give your dad a big hug for me, please. Absolutely, we're gonna watch that Steiner match too. Please, man, and watch it with some popcorn because it's very entertaining. Awesome, thanks so much. You got it. Love you guys. <laughs> Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the northeastern U.S., Washington, D.C., and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com for cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital. If you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.